Hi and welcome to my first car review in English. We'll see how this works out. I usually really like the Golf GTI. They're fantastic cars, they're great daily drivers, they're usually reliable, <laughs> with a few exceptions. They are cars that are comfortable to drive, they're fast, they can take turns properly. But when it comes to a third generation Golf GTI, I'm not that sure. I've never really liked them, to be fair, although I've never driven them. And the reason why I don't like them is because they've always been, in my opinion, the most disappointing Golf GTI. See, the second generation Golf GTI had a 1.8 liter engine that put out 112 horsepower and it weighed about a thousand kilos. And when they came out with the third generation, power remained about the same. This car has a two liter, eight valve engine that puts out 115 horsepower. However, they also put a lot more sound isolating material in the interior. The car is a lot safer than the second generation Golf. And it has a lot more equipment also. So that means the third generation Golf GTI weighs 200 kilos more than its predecessor. If you've got the same power and 200 kilos more, you're going to have a slower car. And that's true, this car in terms of acceleration and speed is actually a lot slower than the second generation Golf GTI. And yes, to be fair, there were more powerful versions of this Golf GTI. There was a 16 valve engine and there was the VR6, the six cylinder engine. However, most of the Golf GTIs of the third generation that you're going to see out in the street are going to be cars like these. Um, with the 8-valve engine. It's the first time in my life that I actually get to drive one. And this car is in immaculate condition. It drives fantastically. But will it be enough to change my preconceived notion that the third generation Golf GTI is the worst Golf GTI? We'll see about that. Let's dive right into the history of this car. The 8-valve GTI was introduced in 1992 and produced until 1997, although the car in this video was built in 1996. This is actually quite a special car, as it is a 20th anniversary special edition that celebrated the two decades of the GTI. It was exclusively sold in the European car market, where only 2,000 units were produced. 1,000 units were 3 doors, and another 1,000 were 5 doors. Only 600 of the three-door units carried the 8-valve engine. What makes a 20th anniversary GTI stand out? Well, it came with smoke taillights and fog lights, red stripes on the front and rear bumpers, and red stitching on the steering wheel. Some units, but not all, had seats with a red checkered pattern. The real telltale sign that this is a 20th anniversary, though, are the wheels. These are some wonderful and truly very 90s 16-inch BBS. MK3 Golf models with 16-inch wheels as standard are incredibly rare considering even the VR6s had 15s. In turn, those larger wheels are there to make way for the larger brakes that this special edition has. That's the only performance difference between the normal GTIs and these 20th anniversary. The other differences are there just for looks. It should be noted that despite the relative rarity of the special edition, these third generation Golfs are not valuable at all, and certainly do not fetch a much higher price than the regular MK3 GTIs fetch. That is one of the reasons why the owner, who has had this car since 2007, has decided to keep it. He believes a unit like his might not be worth much more than 5,000 euros. He reckons that the sentimental value and coolness factor of owning such a rare car is worth so much more than that. I should say that, despite the low price, finding one of these in good, let alone splendid condition is a very tough task, as these cars were boy racer favorites in the early 2000s. You might have better luck finding the Malaysia Airlines plane. And what's it like to drive this third generation Golf GTI. Let's take it for a spin and have a look. Well, for starters, this is an incredibly rev happy car. It just likes to rev. And what I mean by that is that even a very light tap of the accelerator while the clutch is pressed will make the revs soar. Of course, once you start driving fast, you notice that there's only 115 horsepower, which wasn't a lot even back in the day. I should say that this 8-valve engine is pretty much bulletproof, but, you know, you cannot make up for the lack of power. So you're just driving along, and when you're driving along, it feels like a normal 90s Golf, if that means anything to you. 
I should say that the ride is fairly firm. I'm very surprised it's this firm for a 90s car, considering this car is completely stock. Most cars in the 90s had pretty, um, so to say, soft suspensions, at least compared to today's standards. But this Golf is actually firm. When you go through like expansion joints in the highway or these bumps here, you can really tell that the ride is firm, it's hard. You can really notice the lack of power when you're like pulling out of a light. I had a Hyundai Tucson ahead of me and the guy was obviously not accelerating and yet I couldn't really keep up with him. Let's accelerate a little bit on the highway. And that's 100. You can hear all the noise, none of the acceleration. I really like to take this car on a mountain road to see if its ability to turn compensates the lack of power. I mean, overall, it's not a bad car. Considering um, how much these are worth today, I'd say it's a pretty good buy. The engine remains exactly the same as in the other 8-valve GTIs. In my opinion, this is the Achilles heel of these cars. Not in reliability, actually quite the opposite, but rather in sheer power and performance. The engine is a mythical, although some would rather say prehistoric, BW EA827 engine, also called AP in South America. It was originally used in the Audi 80 in the early 1970s and remained in production well into the 2020s. Truth be told, it's absolutely bulletproof and this Golf might be one of the easiest cars to work on ever made. Just look at it, no weird components, plenty of space, everything is easy to find and reach, but one would expect the sporty version of a commuter car to be at least a tad sporty and this car is incredibly slow and was slow even back in its day. As I said before, the MK3 Golf is nearly a quarter of a ton heavier than the MK2 Golf, but without carrying any extra punch. The 16 valve or 6 cylinder version of these cars get all the attention today and I think that is rightly so. But if you're not looking for a 20th anniversary edition Golf, you can get a normal GTI for around 1500 euros today. A true bargain when it comes to performance. I should say I was expecting much poorer fuel economy from this car. Even after driving in city traffic, testing its acceleration, or lack of, at any chance I got, and letting it idle with the AC on while I figured out what to say in this review, I still managed to get slightly over 8 liters per 100 kilometers. Not a bad figure at all. When it comes to numbers, this car has 115 horsepower and 166 newton meters of torque, all sent to the front wheels through a 5-speed manual gearbox shaped like a golf ball. This car came equipped with two electric windows, electric side mirrors, dual airbag and ABS. It also has air conditioning, although that was an option. It should be said that I don't think anyone here in very hot Spain forgot to take that option. The MK3 Golf also have that pretty cool trip computer that lets you cycle through some very useful information such as oil temperature, exterior temperature or average fuel consumption with a tiny arrow showing you what you're looking at. So now that I've driven the third generation Golf GTI, have I changed my mind? Do I now think this is a great Golf GTI? Do I now like this third generation? The short answer to that is no. I still think that the third generation Golf GTI is the worst Golf GTI. This car doesn't have that sort of rawness that the first and second generation of the Golf GTI have, and it doesn't feel fast as the modern GTIs do, like the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th and current 8th generation Golf GTI do. However, I do have to say that not everything is that bad when it comes to this car. Putting power aside, it's a fantastic car to drive. It turns, it brakes, it makes you feel everything when you're driving it in pure 90s fashion. And really, to be fair, the main issue, the only issue is power. If this car were a lot more powerful, you'd probably put aside the weight issues that it has in comparison to its predecessors. And that makes me actually remember that there are more powerful versions of this Golf GTI. Although, as I said before, most of them were sold with the 2-liter 8-valve engine, you've still got the 150 horsepower 2-liter 16-valve engine, and you've got the mythical VR6 with the 6-cylinder. I haven't driven those cars, but it really makes me wonder if those cars are maybe what this Golf GTI should have been. Perhaps 
I should drive one of those and get back to you. I hope you liked this video. Don't forget to leave a comment and subscribe for more content on this channel. See you later.